Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing on what uh, I'm sure will be a riveting subject, uh, especially if you're the chairman of the FCC, the uh, budget and spending of the Federal Communications Commission. Despite the uh, groans and droopy eyelids, uh, some of us were up pretty late last night negotiating on the uh, final spectrum uh, piece in the, in the big piece, um, we, uh, and some of you were watching pretty intently. Um, this is really important. This is uh, important work that we're doing here today. Uh, we have an obligation as a subcommittee to review the budgets and spending activities of every agency under our jurisdiction, whether they get that money from uh, ratepayers or users or from the general taxpayers. And so I welcome the chairman of the FCC, Mr. Janikowski, here today. Um, given the state of our nation's finances, I think it's time to call all hands on deck. As the uh, Committee with Jurisdiction over the Federal Communications Commission, it is our responsibility to review how the Federal Communications Commission collects and spends federal funds. We are the committee that created the FCC, although I don't think any of us was exactly, well, may, maybe some were around when that happened. I don't think so, though. We're the committee that created the FCC. We're the committee that authorized it to collect regulatory fees. We're the committee that authorized spectrum auctions. And we are the committee that enabled the creation of the Universal Service Fund. It's high time that we looked clearly and deeply at how this commission spends money outside of the yearly appropriations process. Three days ago, the administration released its proposed budget for fiscal year 2013. And the FCC has, in turn, submitted its corresponding budget estimates. And I was pleased to see some of those numbers. Last year, the FCC was given a budget of $424.8 million, and the FCC has reported that it can maintain current services with a budget of $421.2 million. Although that's less than a 1% decrease, hey, it's a start, and I appreciate the work the FCC is doing to keep costs down. But the FCC's proposal still leaves some open questions about its budget. What are the concrete results that taxpayers and regulatees can expect if Congress funds the FCC's requested new programs? If it consolidates its data centers as proposed, what will that produce in terms of savings, and will those savings be rolled into a lower base budget next year? And what is it doing to redirect its existing resources to address uh, and resolve its backlogs and respond to changes in the marketplace? Similarly, I want to explore a bit about the sources of the FCC's funding. For example, it withholds up to $85 million each year to cover the costs of spectrum auctions. Is that sufficient? Does it actually need all of that money to conduct auctions? The rest of the FCC's own funding comes from regulatory fees, which are supposed to be assessed on the communications industry in proportion to the benefits that industry receives from the Commission. Given the swiftly converging communications marketplace, I'm interested in how the Commission has reevaluated and reapportioned regulatory fees to ensure that all are paying their fair share. Finally, I want to uh, better understand how the FCC's watchdogs, the Inspector General and the Universal Service Administrative Company, are funded and what they're doing to combat waste, fraud, and abuse. Although <clears throat> the Universal Service Fund isn't paid for with taxpayer funds, it does come out of the pocketbooks of taxpayers in the form of consumers. And the American people deserve to know uh, that that money is being well spent. What is USAC doing to streamline the universal service funding process so that funded companies can focus on serving their constituents and not filling out paperwork? Conversely, what are USAC and the Inspector General doing to make sure that universal service funds are not wasted or fraudulently obtained? What's the bang for the buck that we're getting from these watchdogs and are additional resources needed to equip their oversight efforts? I thank today's witnesses, Chairman Janikowski, Inspector General Hunt, and Mr. Barash for attending today's hearing and helping us sort through these important budgetary issues. With your help, we'll have a better handle on what Congress can do to reduce the cost of government and improve its efficiency and accountability. With that, I would uh, welcome my colleague from California, Ms. Eshoo, and turn over the time to her for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to everyone. Welcome, uh, Chairman Jenikowski. Uh, the last time uh, this committee authorized appropriations for the FCC was in 1990, uh, it's before I came to Congress, uh, and it was when uh, my friend um, uh, Ed Markey chaired what was then known as the Telecommunications and Finance Subcommittee. At that time, Congress authorized 109.83, 
and $119.83 million for fiscal years 90 and 91 for spending on what now seems like a technological uh, technology stone age. Uh, today we're examining the proposed uh, fiscal 2013 budget of $346.78 million for the Commission and its operations over a complex advanced telecommunications sector. The FCC is charged with a portfolio of technological challenges. These include making broadband available to all Americans, finding new sources of spectrum, upgrading and reforming universal service, fostering public safety, interoperability, E911 dependability and availability, and reforming the internal mechanisms of an agency that's been in continuous operation since 1934. These are not easy tasks, but they're essential to the economic well-being of our country. In reviewing the Commission's budget, I'm sure we want to know first and foremost if the Commission has made every effort to streamline its budget while ensuring that it has the financial resources to perform its mission. In my view, we have to balance budget cuts with smart investments. Our nation's advanced uh, communications are increasingly essential for new opportunities in almost every sector, including small businesses, education, health care, and the government. Money spent wisely at the Commission can give us a good bang for our buck. Enhancements in the agency's cloud security and upgrades to the technical equipment used in the FCC's laboratory are two such examples. I can see from the FCC's budget that the Commission has a 10-year low in federal employees, that the contracting staff has been cut nearly in half during the past year. I wish that, I wish that were the case in the uh, intelligence community. Uh, the, uh, and that the Commission is currently operating under a budget that's lower than it was in 2009, with a 2 percent increase over the previous year's spending level. Um, this doesn't sound exactly like empire building to me. Um, Chairman Janikowski, I look forward to hearing about where the FCC stands today and where you envision the agency to be in the future. I also look forward to hearing from uh, the FCC's Inspector General Hunt. Uh, Inspector Generals are, uh, in my book, uh, a group of the most important people in the, uh, in the federal government, and Scott uh, uh, Barish, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, uh, the CEO of the uh, Universal Service uh, Administrative Company, uh, USAC, and uh, on how their work and budgets complement uh, the mandate of the Communications Act. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very important um, hearing. It's been a long time since we've had one on this subject matter, and I will yield the balance of my time to uh, uh, Congresswoman Matsui. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Eshi, for yielding me time. I also thank Chairman Janikowski for being with us here today. The FCC, under the Chairman's leadership, has been dealing with important issues head on, many of which were difficult to address. The FCC's funding is essentially flat and have had limited staff movement since 2008, yet the FCC has moved major policy reforms forward. Just over the past few months, for instance, some of the important reforms have been to the Universal Service Fund. While not perfect, the reforms that the FCC put forth to both the high-cost fund and to the low-income fund are bold attempts to bring the USF into the 21st century. The FCC maintained its commitment to restrain any uncontrolled growth within the Universal Service Fund. I also support USF reforms aimed at addressing duplication and abuse within these programs. These reforms will likely require additional yet effective resources to properly certify households and enforce necessary requirements. The FCC's Lifeline proposal to develop a pilot program to expand Lifeline for broadband will enable Americans living in both rural and urban areas to access affordable broadband services. After a viable pilot is conducted, it is my hope that the program becomes permanent and a reality for millions of Americans. Lastly, I look forward to your continued leadership as Congress seems poised to provide the FCC authority to conduct incentive auctions and supporting the continued use of unlicensed spectrum for American innovation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding today's hearing, and I yield back the balance of my time. Chair recognizes, thank you. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Nebraska. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our witness, uh, Mr. Janikowski, for being here today, and we've had a good working relationship, and I really appreciate that. 
The AFCC uh, this last year has tackled many of the toughest issues, uh, particularly high cost USF. Uh, and while I think maybe the screws were ratcheted a little too tightly and uh, we may have to uh, review that order, that's not the subject of why we're here today. It is uh, to review the budget, uh, see where you see the FCC going forward, like all uh, of Congress and committees in our individual offices uh, who have received 12% cuts and cutting staff and really focusing to be lean uh, uh, and, and financially mean. Uh, we're seeing where you see the FCC doing the same thing, and that's what we want to hear. Uh, on issues uh, of USF overall, while you were able to get some controls in place on the high cost, we see lack of controls and explosion in other areas of USF, uh, particularly in link up uh, in Lifeline, and want to see uh, how you're going to control that, what your plans are in that area. Uh, so I look forward to your testimony, and with that, I'll yield to the gentlelady from Tennessee. I thank the gentleman, and Mr. Chairman, we welcome you. We're, we appreciate that you're here, and you're going to give us the opportunity to talk with you about this budget. You know, at a time when the Defense Department is taking a $32 billion cut, and looking at that right on the table, uh, we are kind of curious as to why the FCC would say we need a 2% bump. And we want to make certain that we review that with you. As others have said, you know, part of this focuses on your agenda. Some of us think that you have supported or have moved toward an agenda that is restricting free markets and innovation, and that sometimes you're getting into issues that we don't, places where we don't think you should be going, um, and you do it because you say you can. Um, Section 706, your interpretation on that, the same language that you used for net neutrality regulations, data roaming mandates, things of that nature. You and I have discussed that, and so maybe this is a time for us to see some regulatory humility and restraint and pull those issues and say, is that the proper use of your time? And so I appreciate the chairman of the subcommittee allowing us to work with you and have the time to review this purpose that you have in your budget and then the means in that you go through in using the dollars that are given to you. I yield back. Uh, does, do any of our other members want to? Mr. Scalise, Mr. Latta, do you want to use any of the remaining time or should we get on with the hearing? Okay. Uh, Mr. Dingle, would you like to uh, offer an opening statement? Mr. Chairman, defer just briefly, if you please. Uh, I don't believe we have any other speakers right. on our side, then, or I would. Then, at, at, at your suggestion, I will proceed. Mr. Chairman, I have some questions. What's this? I don't have an opening statement, so I will right. defer on that. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, then I don't see any other members, uh, and we'll uh, have not had a chance to say something. So, Mr. Janikowski, uh, the microphone is yours for a limited duration. We'll take it back later. But... Um, <laughs> We do appreciate your being here, um, and we look forward to your testimony, and uh, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Walden and Ranking Member Eshoo, the other members who are here uh, for the opportunity to appear today. Uh, before taking your questions, I'd like to make two overarching points about the FCC's uh, budget. First, the FCC creates tremendous value for our economy and the American people. Indeed, few, if any, federal agencies deliver a higher return on investment than the FCC. Spectrum auctions have raised more than $50 billion for the U.S. Treasury, and economists regard the economic value created by FCC auctions as being about 10 times that number, $500 billion. The U.S. has long led the world in developing policies to unleash Spectrum for mobile investment and innovation. The FCC was the first agency to develop Spectrum auctions and also the first to free up so-called junk bands for unlicensed use, such as Bluetooth, cordless phones, and Wi-Fi. As Wi-Fi plays an increasingly important role in the Spectrum ecosystem, the economic benefit created by unlicensed Spectrum is estimated at up to $37 billion a year. Uh, because of the work of this committee and the Senate Commerce Committee, the voluntary incentive auctions proposed in the FCC's national broadband plan 
could become the next big value-creating breakthrough in spectrum policy, leading to very substantial new auctions of spectrum. And freeing up unlicensed spectrum for white spaces and other higher-powered unlicensed use holds tremendous promise to become another value-creating breakthrough on the order of magnitude of Wi-Fi. Spectrum policy is just part of the FCC's overall efforts to create value by promoting private investment, innovation, competition, and job creation. Through our broadband acceleration initiative, the FCC has removed barriers to broadband deployment and accelerated broadband build-out. For example, we've adopted orders to ease access to utility poles and established a shot clock to speed cell, cell tower and antenna siting. As the FCC does its work under the Communications Act, more than 95% of our decisions have been bipartisan and our policies are working. Investment, job creation, and innovation are up across the information and communications technology sector, the broadband economy. These metrics are up both when looking at broadband apps and services and when looking at broadband providers and networks. In 2011, the U.S. tech sector grew three times faster than the overall economy. Broadband is helping create new jobs all across the country, and not just for engineers, but also for construction workers, salespeople, and small business owners who are increasingly using the Internet to increase sales and lower costs. The apps economy, which barely existed in 2009, has already created almost 500,000 new jobs, according to expert estimates. The U.S. has regained global leadership in mobile innovation. We are also now ahead of the world in deploying 4G mobile broadband at scale. And these next-generation 4G networks are projected to add $151 billion in GDP growth over the next four years, creating a projected 770,000 new American jobs. Broadband providers invested tens of billions of dollars in wired and wireless networks in the first three quarters of 2011, a double-digit increase over the same period in 2010. Internet startups attracted $7 billion in venture capital in 2011, almost double 2009 levels, and the most investment since 2001. The value contributions I've identified would be enhanced even further by closing broadband gaps, and so the agency is focused on bringing universal service into the broadband era. Today, approximately 18 million rural Americans live in areas with no broadband infrastructure. Our plan, adopted in October to modernize the Universal Service Fund, will spur wired and wireless broadband build-out to hundreds of thousands of rural homes in the near term and put us on a path to universal broadband by the end of the decade without increasing the size of the fund. The major overhaul of USF and intercarrier compensation was done on a unanimous basis at the Commission and with bipartisan support by this committee, and I thank you for that. In addition to the broadband deployment gap, we're making strides on the broadband adoption gap. Nearly a third of Americans, 100 million people, haven't adopted broadband. Our Connect to Compete initiative enlists government, nonprofit, and private sector leaders to tackle the barriers to adoption, one of several public-private partnerships driven by the Commission to promote solutions to major challenges. We've adopted smart reforms to the successful E-rate program, helping schools and libraries. And working with this committee, the FCC is also implementing the recently enacted legislation, such as the Communications and Video Accessibility Act and the, Low, and the Local Community Radio Act. The agency is working to harness the power of communications to make our public safer. We've granted waivers authorizing more than 20 jurisdictions to begin development of an interoperable public safety broadband network and we support bipartisan congressional efforts to fund such a network. We're working with multiple stakeholders to advance next generation 911, an issue that ranking member Eshoo and Congressman Chinkas uh, have championed along with others on the committee. And we accelerated the launch of PLAN, a reverse 911 alert system that allows local, state, and federal authorities to send targeted alerts to mobile devices during an emergency. The FCC also provides value by protecting and empowering consumers as we've done with our Bill Shock Text Alert Initiative and our Small Business Cyber Planner, as well as our enforcement activities. The FCC provides value to our economy and the American people in many ways. That's point one. Point two is that the FCC is committed to smart, responsible government, and we've taken significant steps to modernize our programs and ensure that they are efficient and fiscally responsible, saving billions of dollars. Our work to modernize USF and intercarrier compensation will not only spur broadband build-out, it also eliminates billions of dollars in hidden subsidies on consumers' phone bills. Our work to reform the Lifeline program is expected to save up to $2 billion over the next three years and includes an elimination of link-up. Even before the order was adopted, we made changes that eliminated 270,000 duplicate subscriptions, saving $33 million in 2011. 
We've reformed our video relay service program, which provides vital communications for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, saving about $250 million without reducing availability of service. In addition to our programmatic changes, we've also reviewed the agency's rules and processes, asking tough questions to make sure the agency is operating efficiently and effectively. In connection with this review, we've already eliminated more than 200 outdated rules and five unnecessary data collections. We've identified two dozen more data collections for elimination, including seven voted on at yesterday's commission meeting. We've significantly reduced backlogs, including, for example, a 52% reduction in satellite licensing applications and increased the inclusion of proposed rules and NPRMs from 38% to 86%. We've made it a priority to move information and processes online, for example, revising our rules for the filing of all tariffs electronically, decreasing burdens on carriers and the commission. We estimate that internal reforms like consolidated IT maintenance and new financial system have already saved the agency $8 million. And we've been able to do everything I've listed and more with the lowest number of full-time employees in 10 years. Harnessing 21st century communications technology to deliver value to the American people and doing so in a smart and fiscally responsible way, that's the FCC's record the past three years and that's our plan for the year and years ahead as reflected in our fiscal 2013 requested budget. Because we are funded by fees, the budget is deficit neutral, uh, though of course we're sensitive to those regulatory fees. The budget reflects a 2% increase uh, in spending. It is flat on dollars adjusting for inflation. We plan to be flat on the number of full-time employees. The budget includes a few new initiatives, primarily technology investments designed to save money and public safety investments aimed at saving lives. The budget includes proposals to reauthorize the Commission's auction authority, which expires in September 2012, and to provide incentive auction authority, which I hope Congress will grant in a way that enables the FCC to maximize the amount and benefit of recovered spectrum for our economy. The budget lays out strategic goals for the FCC, such as promoting innovation, investment, and America's global competitiveness, which will keep the agency focused on policies that will yield a substantial return on investment for our economy and the American people. I look forward to continuing to work with this committee. We've incorporated many of your suggestions over the last three years. Uh, I look forward to continuing constructive engagement with each of you. Chairman, thank you. I uh, can't help myself having been here till about 1 o'clock in the morning on negotiating some of these things. Part of your testimony is so like 10.38 p.m., you know? <laughs> Others like, well, maybe. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to ask you about the Universal Service Fund. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion about that, and uh, uh, Terry and others have spent a lot of their life uh, trying to uh, help improve this system, and I'm sure you'll hear more from them. But uh, the contribution factor is 17.9% this quarter, projected to stay above 17%, so it's coming right off the phone bill. Uh, when will the Commission take a hard look at contributions reform? We'll be doing that in the near future. Our strategy was to first tackle the spend in the programs, get those under control, direct them to where they should be directed. Having done that, the next step is to look at the contribution base and get that in a, uh, a, a healthy place. We thought it made sense to sequence them, uh, but so the next step in the sequence is contributions. Six months, three months, next week, a year? Uh, I'd say starting the process certainly within the next six months. Okay. Um, the, I noticed in the, in the Commission's budget there's a proposal for $1.1 million for eight new vehicles along with equipment that can be used to detect sources of radio interference. Can you uh, explain to us how these eight vehicles end up costing $1.1 million? I know that's pretty spe specific and granular, but it does stand out. These are vehicles that are used to uh, detect and prevent interference uh, across the spectrum, so to speak, from uh, aviation interference to pirate radio. Uh, uh, it does require sophisticated equipment. Uh, they're also used in times of disaster to help with uh, uh, early assessment and recovery efforts. Uh, we've certainly uh, insisted that um, uh, the professional staff at the agency responsible for this uh, keep those numbers as low as possible. In many cases, they're replacing equipment that objectively should have been replaced 10 years ago. All right. We may follow up a little bit on that. Um, the, the Commission's budget proposes half a million dollars for a study on the link between the identity of, broadcast sta uh, of a broadcast station owner and that station's, quote, service, including important content to all Americans, close quote. Do you, do you know what that's about and what the, uh, what the link is? Is that 
to something regarding ongoing media ownership? There, there are several statutory provisions that in order for us to uh, implement, we need uh, data. And this is uh, uh, agreed upon by everyone at the commission. There's section 257, uh, which requires us to understand what's going on with small businesses. There are the ownership provisions and they're the EEO provisions. Right. Uh, we're also under a directive from the Third Circuit to improve uh, our data in this area. Uh, as you know, we're starting um, uh, small uh, with an initial uh, essentially study of studies so that we can make sure that uh, what we do in this area, what we need to do under the Communications Act is done as efficiently as possible. It just seems like $500,000 a lot of money for a study of studies. I uh, no, well, the, the, the study of studies will cost uh, much less than that, under 100000 Uh The 500000 is a budget amount for uh, what would be the next step. Uh, I will tell you that the uh, uh, prior studies of the sort have uh, cost closer to $1 uh, uh, million. Uh, and in the spirit of fiscal responsibility, what we have said to our team at the agency is we're just going to have to figure out a way to do it for a lot less. Well, so this is a link between uh, media ownership and content, or what? What are you really looking at? The, the media ownership provisions in the statute are one area where the studies will help us exercise our responsibilities. They're not the only area, small businesses, uh, and EEO. Uh, so this will, it's part of what we need to do to have the data that we need uh, to be able to uh, uh, take whatever steps are appropriate. Uh, the Commission opened a docket to consider reclassifying broadband as a Title II service, as you well know, back in 2009. That docket remains open today. How many employees are currently working on that docket, and why is it still open? I'm not aware that any employees are working on the, on the, uh, on the docket uh, now. Um, uh, well, why not close it? Uh, sorry? Why not close it then if nobody's working on it? It's been open since '09. Uh, it, it's something that we'll consider. It's not. We've been focused on uh, U.S. Well, you're here. We can consider it now. You know. <laughs> it, it's something I'll discuss with our staff and, uh, and our <laughs> colleagues. All right. All right. Uh, finally, on on my questions, uh, you note in your written statement the commission's allowed 20 jurisdictions to start deploying interoperable communications in the 700 meg public safety spectrum. My understanding is that uh, 30 more applications are waiting in the wings, but that the review process has stalled. If states are ready to go, including we've heard from Oklahoma, uh, and already have the funding to deploy their own networks at their, their own cost, why is the commission uh, holding them back? Well, I, I, I will say that uh, assuming Congress in the next, uh, in the near term, uh, adopts the legislation before it, including funding a public safety broadband network, uh, that will make it very easy for us to complete this very quickly. Uh, we've uh, had a certain amount of humility and caution here because uh, we don't want to uh, start things going that then will be different from what Congress instructs us to do. Uh, so I think we're at a point where I understand the frustration and at some point, we have to go ahead and do the waivers, even if Congress doesn't act. Uh, but I'm hoping that Congress is on a path to make this easy. Certainly, if Congress does pass the legislation, we'll move forward very, very quickly because it's very important. All right. Thank you. My time's expired. I'll turn to the uh, gentlelady from California. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I think that um, uh, you raised um, uh, the point about uh, the $85 million in auction proceeds in your uh, I think you did in your opening statement, but uh, I'd like Chairman uh, Jenikowski to elaborate on how the FCC uses um, the 85 uh, million. Sure, in, in many different ways. You know, auction is a constant activity mm -hmm. at the FCC. Uh, preparing for auctions, uh, uh, licensing post-auction, uh, and we conduct many more auctions than people realize because many auctions are not uh, high-profile right. uh, auctions. We conducted. How long do they usually take? What's the average length of time? Uh, for an uh, weeks mm -hmm. uh, would be the average. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, but the work that goes into all the auctions uh, and the work that comes in implementing auctions is really very significant. Uh, the uh, we receive as an agency internally requests each year to spend uh, what would amount to more than the $85 million figure. Uh, because we do think that there's more and more work we could do that would generate a positive return on investment, but we work within the $85 million cap, and there are things that we say no to because they hit the cap. Uh, under the um, 
the 2013 budget request submitted to Congress earlier this week, the agency requested $2.5 million to consolidate uh, agency data centers. I mean, it's not a huge amount of money. Uh, but do you have an estimate on the agency's um, long-term savings from the decision? Yes. Uh, uh, for the various uh, data initiatives that we've included, um, uh, we've run ROI analysis for the data center consolidation. Um, uh, our analysis shows that we would save a little over a million dollars a year, about $1.1 .1 million a year once it's completed. So it's a $2.5 million investment to save a million a year on an uh, uh, ongoing basis, so it should pay for itself in two years. We expect that to be complete in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, on the uh, Agile Cloud um, uh, updates, we expect that to yield a savings of about almost a million and a half dollars a year. Uh, so again, it pays for itself in the first year or two, and then on an ongoing basis, uh, we expect it to save 1.4 over time. Uh, and these are both the kinds of things that private companies uh, are doing and they know they need to do to save money. Right. Uh, it's my understanding that there are increasing bottlenecks in the uh, FCC's laboratory in terms of reviewing new advanced handheld uh, devices uh, like smartphones and tablets that use LTE technology. Uh, what's the FCC doing to uh, expedite the device uh, approval process and does this require additional uh, engineering staff? Well, this is something that I'm area. concerned about, and mm -hmm. your, your question is right on target. We've had an unbelievable, unbelievable proliferation mm -hmm. of devices in the last few years, right. um, and each device has more antennas inside of it than it used to. And so the work of, uh, to certify devices has gotten a lot greater, and that process is under pressure. Uh, we launched an internal review of this uh, a few months ago, uh, this is handled out of our Office of Engineering and Technology, uh, uh, and they are working on recommendations on how we can uh, meet this new world where the volume of devices that have to be certified is going way up. Mm -hmm. Do you have any outstanding um, issues relative to the IG that have not yet been fully implemented by the uh, FCC? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, we, we take the role of the IG uh, very seriously. Uh, he has uh, independence uh, and uh, the, the track record of uh, savings prosecutions over the last few years has been very significant. Thank you. Uh, I'll yield back. Generally yields back her time. Chairman recognize the vice chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Terry. Thank you, Mr. Walden. I want to thank you again uh, for coming to Nebraska and coming to a couple of our great cities like Liberty and Diller. Um, towns of, what, 50 people or something like that and 290. So uh, uh, it was a great uh, uh, event and hopefully uh, everyone learned a little bit. Speaking of high cost fund, though, uh, as Greg mentioned, uh, asked the question about the contribution side. And the bill that Rick Boucher and I did paired the two. Uh, and on the contribution side, there was always a thought that you needed legislative support for that area. Do you feel that you need legislative support to be able to uh, change or adopt different ways to bring new revenue in, or not new revenue, but <laughs> make everyone that does primarily voice pay into uh, the Universal Service Fund as it was intended. Do you need us? Uh, I'm not sure yet. Our general counsel's office has looked at this. That'll be something that we uh, look at in the proceeding. Uh, 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 certainly, uh, uh, we'd, we'd come to you and ask for help if we need it, and we'll work together to make sure that we understand uh, the authority that's there. All right. Well, I appreciate the work that's been uh, done so far, but keep us up to date. Uh, the second part is... On the other part, as I mentioned in my opening statement of LinkUp and Lifeline, you mentioned that LinkUp is going to be phased out. I'd like you to comment further on that uh, time. Uh, what, are you just going to merge the two into uh, Lifeline? And then how do we control the exploding costs in Lifeline specifically? Is there a plan set out? And, um, well, go ahead and answer that. 
So we took this reform very seriously, uh, uh, and we reviewed all aspects of the program. Uh, we eliminated LinkUp completely. It wasn't okay. eliminated over here and put in over there because we thought that the, um, uh, the, the mechanism of providing, I believe it was a $30 bounty for every uh, Lifeline customer that was signed up, created incentives for waste, fraud, and abuse. And as the market had changed, it simply couldn't be justified. And there were some people who came to us and said, why don't you just reduce the amount? We looked at it and we said, we can't justify that part of the program at all. And we eliminated it. And I think uh, a sign of our seriousness. With respect to the rest of the program, we tackled in a systematic way the problems that we saw. There are problems with uh, duplicates, uh, people uh, receiving uh, lifeline support uh, twice when they shouldn't. Uh, we've taken steps on that, including moving toward uh, a database uh, that will make it uh, much, much easier for states and companies to enforce uh, or to prevent duplicates. Um, uh, we tackled and ident we identified and tackled other unscrupulous practices. Uh, it is an important program. We have a history in this country of making sure that the lowest income among us have access to basic communication services. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that the program is on a strong foundation. Uh, and, and we were highly motivated to make sure that anything in the program we couldn't defend, we got rid of. Well, I appreciate that. You mentioned $2 billion over three years. I want you to get into a little more granular. Where's that $2 billion coming from? It's, it's uh, uh, the, the status quo um, increases that we inherited if we had done nothing. We're on a curve. I think both uh, uh, Chairman Walden and you mentioned it. Uh, that curve was going up at a rate uh, that was very hard to defend. Now, in a bad economy, it's not surprising that this particular program goes up because low-income people are eligible for it. In a bad economy, there are more people who qualify. So it's not surprising that this program would go up um, in bad times, and it should go down in good times. Uh, uh, also, communication services are becoming more essential. But it was going up too fast, uh, and our goal was to remove from the, uh, the, you know, the up uh, all of the wasteful, inefficient, unjustifying spending. And so what we believe we did is you know, turn this line into this line, and over the next two or three years, that's a $2 billion difference in the program. Uh, my next question will take more than 25 seconds to answer, so I'll just submit it for writing. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me to Nebraska. That trip was uh, very valuable and informed in a positive way uh, our reform. Only the things that you liked, the, the, the other things we got from other states. Wow. And you said that under oath, right? You know you're... <laughs> <laughs> Chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since uh, the 20 years uh, that Congress last uh, reauthorized the FCC, this subcommittee has held uh, oversight uh, hearings to look at your budget and to also to uh, uh, review how the agency is functioning. And I want to say that by all accounts, uh, the FCC under your leadership is well managed and it operates in a transparent and open manner. Since you became chairman, the agency has reformed the way dockets are managed, the number of notices of proposed rulemakings that contain the full text of rules has increased from 38% to 85%. The amount of time between a vote on a commission decision and the release of the full text of the decision has decreased from 14 calendar days to three calendar days, with a majority of actions released in one calendar day. And the ex parte rules underwent significant reform. The FCC has closed 999 dormant dockets, which represents approximately a third of the agency's open proceedings, while reducing the number of pending broadcast applications by 30 percent and the number of pending satellite applications by 89 percent. In addition, the FCC has removed or streamlined unnecessary requirements. 190 obsolete regulations have been removed since November 2011, and the Commission is working to eliminate unnecessary data collections and exempting small businesses from certain uh, reporting requirements. The FCC has also made great efforts under your leadership to work on a bipartisan basis. 95% of agency actions over the past two years have been bipartisan. And finally, staff morale has improved so much that the FCC was named the most improved 
federal agency. This was accomplished despite a flat budget and flat staffing levels. On the issues, FCC has been greatly ambitious. The Commission has tackled difficult topics from universal service and intercarrier compensation reform, open Internet protections, and numerous measures to promote broadband deployment. All of these efforts require a tremendous amount of time and dedication from the FCC staff as well as agency resources. Uh, based on my experiences over the past few years working closely with the agency, I'm convinced that the FCC employs a disproportionate number of the most talented, experienced, and dedicated public servants in government. Now, while you deserve a great deal of credit for all these accomplishments, I'm confident that these accomplishments would not happen unless you realize you had to come before this subcommittee and answer our questions. And I, uh, but I do want to pay tribute to the work that you have been doing uh, since this is an opportunity to ask you a question. And the hearing is on the FCC's budget. Uh, you're going to be overseeing one of the most innovative and complex spectrum auctions ever. Uh, I'd want to know from you what sense uh, of expertise is going to be required to administer this process. And could you provide us with a sense of what skills the Commission staff requires to do the uh, work that they do overseeing the communications marketplace? You, you have talented people with a great deal of expertise. Uh, you've got to be able to pay them adequately, uh, give them a sense of job satisfaction. And, uh, and as we look at the budget for the FCC, we have to recognize the, your needs. So if you could give us some sense of this. Well, first of all, thank you for those very generous comments, and I particularly appreciate the comments about uh, the staff. It is a great staff. Yeah. Uh, they work very hard every day uh, to deliver value to the American public. Uh, and as you know, uh, in addition to um, uh, uh, honoring the staff, the career staff that was there, we focused on bringing in uh, uh, new people representing the full range of skills that the agency needs. Uh, and so lawyers, obviously, but not just lawyers, uh, we need very strong economists. We need very strong engineers. We need very strong business analysts. Uh, we need to understand the landscape in a very sophisticated way. Uh, uh, I do spend a lot of my time uh, on uh, talent. I think we've recruited uh, terrific people to the agency. It has to be an ongoing job. And you're right that implementing the auctions uh, will require the very best of the agency uh, and may well uh, require us to uh, um, uh, add uh, to our expert uh, resources to make sure that we get it right. Well, I think the FCC uh, is government at its best, and I commend you and your staff for doing the excellent work you've been doing, and that's why we're going to give you more work to do. Thank you Thank very you. much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman Jenikowski, as we're talking about budget, and I was getting ready for the hearing, I saw some data from the IRS that suggests that there's a growing trend with regard to FCC employees failing to pay their federal taxes. Were you aware of this? No. You were not? Okay. Well, it seems that with the majority of your employees making over $125,000 a year and with there being a growing percentage of them not paying their taxes, I would think that since the president has as one of his goals for people to pay their fair share, that we would appreciate if this is an issue that could be addressed. And uh, I would like to have your commitment and maybe something in writing that you're going to address this and that we're going to get in behind it, get that cleaned up. I, I, I haven't heard that. We'll certainly look into it. And will you respond back to me on that? Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, looking at regulations that we've got out there, did have you paid attention to the Canadian radio and TV service and They've just gone through a process where they are eliminating and streamlining 60% of their rules. And I think that that is certainly something that uh, it caught my eye. I hope it is catching the eye of yours and your employees. Now, you're going to ask for 140 new employees. Is that correct? That's uh, not correct. I'd be happy to explain. 
Okay. What is the number of new employees that you're the, wanting? Uh, the, the number of employees that we expect to have next year based on the appropriations we're requesting is flat to this year. Uh, there is a higher number that appears, which is uh, essentially uh, a, a ceiling for flexibility, but our appropriations are targeted. And in fact, the budget says uh, that we uh, are planning on being flat for the next year. Okay, so you've got the flexibility in case you need to add people. And, and the circumstances that, where that could theoretically arise, because uh, it doesn't change our appropriations, um, uh, if, for example, uh, we determined that we could save money by insourcing contractors, uh, we've reduced contractors uh, in, by about 50% over the last year. So conceivably, we might say we might save um, money if we took contractors, made them FTEs, so under exactly. our budget, okay. we could do that consistent well, with the Well, let me ask you this. In your budget, you had stated a top priority is to, and I'm quoting, conduct a review of rules and regulations within each FCC bureau and office with the goal of eliminating or revising requirements that are outdated. With what the Canadian Radio and Television Agency has done, I, I hope that that is going to be a top priority. My question and my curiosity was, if you were going to bring in people to make that stated objective a deliverable and an outcome that a year from now we can say the FCC has indeed done this. Um, so my question is, what is the degree of priority that you're going to... Budgets are about priorities, and we would like to see removing outdated rules and regulations a priority. So if, if I may, this has been a priority from day one. One of the first hires I made was a special counsel for government reform, uh, and she was tasked with exactly this. Uh, we have someone, again, who is in that role uh, now uh, who is accountable for ongoing uh, review, ongoing elimination of, um, uh, of rules. We'll be happy to look at the Canada uh, situation. I know that uh, other agencies around the world have looked at our reforms um, uh, but I agree with you that one, it's a priority, and two, that if uh, 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 that one has to organize for it and set goals in order to achieve them. Well, and there's a lot of outdated things we'd love to get off the books. One more question. Um, I understand that Section 9 of the Communication Act requires regulatory fees to be apportioned among industries based on full-time equivalent employees. Here's what I don't understand. Your budget proposal suggests that the Wireless Bureau and the Media Bureau each have more employees than the Wireline Bureau, and Wireline providers pay more in regulatory fees than their competitors. So how do you reconcile this with the Act? Uh, uh, I'd like to get back to you on the specifics. In, in general, um, uh, I do think it's possible that uh, a, I don't know if rebalancing is the right word, uh, but looking at the way we do the fees to make sure that they are fair uh, as the markets change is an appropriate goal, and that is something that we are looking at. Okay. I, I think that, as you know, one of the things we'd love to see is for the reach and the scope to come down, your costs to come down. Um, see you go through the type reduction we've done in Congress. We've cut our budget 11 percent. We'd like for you to do the same. Yell back. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Dingle. I have some questions, Mr. Chairman Ganahusky. I ask that the questions be responded to by yes or no. I note your fiscal year 2013 budget requests cuts in the Wireline Bureau's funding by 9% while increasing the budget of your office and that of the other commissioners. Now, am I correct in assuming that the Wireline Bureau is heavily involved in the implementation of the Universal Service and Intercarrier Compensation Order? Yes or no? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, does the 9% increase in the Wireline budget mean that the Commission will complete by the end of this fiscal year all work associated with the USF and ICC order, as well as the necessary follow-on reforms of the USF contribution system. Yes or no? Uh, yes, that is our goal, I believe. I'm sorry? I, I believe that is our goal. We have a 
timetable for so the you're implementation. So yes or hope or hopefully yes. Hopefully yes. Hopefully. Is that is the cut that you're making in the budget there going to expedite or retard the completion of that responsibility? We sought to uh, neither. We sought to make sure that we have the resources we need to move efficiently. Now, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to discuss Executive Order 13589, issued by President Obama November 15, 2011. The order seeks to promote fiscal responsibility amongst the sundry executive agencies. Now, this strikes me as eminently sensible. However, Section 8C of the order requests independent agencies to adhere to it. Does the commission intend to adhere to Executive Order 13589, yes or no? Yes, and we announced that previously. Now, Mr. Chairman, Section 2 of the order instructs agencies to reduce their travel, technology, printing, and certain other costs by 20 percent compared to 2010-11. I commend you for reducing yours and the other commissioners' travel budget by 10.6 percent. Will similar cuts agency-wise help achieve the order's 20 percent reduction goal? Yes or no? Uh, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but we're focused on uh, uh, operating efficiently, meeting our obligations with respect to international um, uh, 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 treaties like the WARC, uh, but reducing travel budget is something that we're certainly looking at. I will ask, Mr. Chairman, that you provide documentation for the record to confirm this, and you'll have a chance to look at it and give, give a, perhaps to your purposes, a more satisfactory response. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Section 3 of the order encourages agencies to devise strategic alternatives to government travel, including local technological alternatives such as teleconferencing and video conferencing. Has the Commission begun any analysis on this particular matter and compliance here? Yes, we've, we've, we've begun to uh, implement that and, uh, uh, and we'd like to implement, we'd like to take advantage of it more. Uh, it'll require uh, resources to be able to conduct effective tele, uh, teleconferences. But. Thank you, Mr. Sa uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, would you please provide a copy of the preliminary results for the record? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I note Section 3 of the order directs agencies to designate a senior level official to be responsible for the developing and implementing policies and controls related to travel costs. Has the Commission complied with that mandate? I believe we have. Would you, des would you tell us the name of the senior level official? You can insert that for the record who will have that responsibility. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if so, which official has been, oh, well, I've, I've asked that question already. Now, on a different topic, Mr. Chairman, are you familiar with the voluntary incentive auction legislation this committee approved last year? And, and, and I assume you are, are yes. you not? Mr. Chairman, do you recognize the strong possibility of interference in border areas of this country with Canadian and Mexican television stations, which might be associated with repacking the markets along border areas, yes or no? We recognize that that's an issue. Now, Mr. Secretary, this is a matter of very special concern to me and a number of other members from border states. Uh, can you assure me that as a result of the repacking process, none of my constituents in Michigan will lose access to over-the-air television sig signals, yes or no? That is the goal, and, 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 our, and of course, we'll faithfully implement the provisions of the law that's adopted. Now, Mr. Secretary, can you give me and my colleagues on this committee the same insurance, assurances, namely that none of their constituents will lose access to an over-the-air television signal, yes or no? Again, that's the goal and will be guided by the act that's adopted. Now, Mr. Chairman, you understand that there are two problems that plague us all. One here is that we will have 
uh, loss of access to over-the-air television signals, but the other is that there will be the creation of significant interference, which will cause trouble to all manner of services if that is not addressed. Are we going to have the service continuing, but somewhat debased by uh, interference? Yes or no? I, I think yes. I, I, didn't under, I didn't hear the last no, part of the question, but I... I understand what that yes means. <laughs> the yes means that we're going to have the service, but we're also going to have interference. Is that right? Well, the, I think the yes means that we're aware of these concerns, and an important part of our work will be to address them consistent with the provisions in the statute. Well, and, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I've, I... I've used more time than I'm entitled to for your courtesy, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. Thank you. And we're going to go now to uh, uh, Mr. Scalise. You're up next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Chairman Janikowski, for coming before us to talk about your budget. Um, I want to follow up on some questions Mr. Terry was asking on the, the free cell phone program, as, as I know a lot of my constituents uh, refer to it. What, what is the actual uh, amount of the tax that people pay uh, to provide that service? Well, as, as uh, the chairman mentioned, there's an overall contribution uh, rate that funds uh, several things, high-cost fund for rural areas, uh, schools, libraries. Right. Uh, Do you have any kind of breakdown, though, is it just not, as it relates to the free cell phone program? Because we've seen a mushrooming, over a 1,000 percent increase in that program over the last 15 years, and it just seems like uh, that specific program has been ripe with uh, waste, fraud, and abuse. I know... You said you're looking into it and, and hope to achieve $2 billion in savings. I mean, the fact that over a three-year period you feel you can get $2 billion in savings says there is tremendous waste, fraud, and abuse. And, you know, especially in tough economic times, you've got people that are struggling. They're maybe working two jobs, uh, and they're struggling to pay their cell phone bill, and yet they're paying an increased tax to provide somebody else with a free cell phone, in some cases, you might have a, a family with four or five free cell phones in the household that they're paying for. It's something a lot of people find real offensive, and it, it just seems like, you know, can we, can we quantify how much in taxes are people paying uh, for that particular program that has mushroomed over the last 15 years? Uh, so a couple of points. I completely agree with your point that uh, in looking at these programs, we both have to look at the recipients and the consumers who are paying into it. And that's been a core part of our work, and it's why we've been so serious about removing any waste or inefficiencies from the, from the program. Can you get me or the full committee uh, the actual cost to consumers, how much people are paying for that, yes. that component? And, you know, and, of course, we can see if we can break it down for how much an individual would pay, but, but definitely the broad cost of what the total cost of the program is. And then if you were to achieve that $2 billion in savings by rooting out the waste, fraud, and abuse, which unfortunately should have been done years ago, but if it's done tomorrow or over the next three years, uh, would, would your commission actually reduce the amount of taxes people are paying under that program to accommodate for the $2 billion in savings? Yes, we don't. The, the, uh, the contribution rate is set by the payouts, and so these savings will translate into lower uh, contributions than otherwise we would have. Is that automatic? Because it seems like an open-ended entitlement, and as the program is mushroomed by a 1,000 percent increase, basically it just forces an increased tax on, on the, the folks the, who are paying. The, the savings are, uh, uh, and the reflection of contribution rate, are automatic. Uh, we can't control things So it's like not at the discretion of the commission. If, if the usage goes down by $2 billion, the tax will go down by $2 billion, or does your commission have to actually do something to lower it? Uh, uh, my, my understanding is that the answer is yes. Whether or not technically the commission has to do something, I, I don't know, but the, there, there's a direct And we'll take a look, because clearly if it's not automatic, I surely would like to see... Uh, CS bring legislation forward that would ensure that the taxpayers would get that $2 billion in savings. It wouldn't just be spent in other places. Um, talk, looking at your budget, you have 12 full-time employees requested in the Wireline Bureau under the goal to maximize the benefits of Spectrum. That seems like a, a duplication of, uh, between Wireline and Wireless. Uh, is there any reason why, why that, that request is there to, to do something that looks like it's duplicated somewhere else? Uh I'd like to get back to you on that. Uh, and in general, we see uh, uh, more and more overlap between what happens, for example, for a, a healthy and successful wireless infrastructure. 
Uh, the wireline backhaul is very important because, of course, the signals go into a tower and then they go into the wires. So that could explain what you're pointing to, but we'll get you a specific explanation. I appreciate that. Uh, switching gears, I want to talk a little bit about video regulation. Um, just like to get your take on on the marketplace when you've got uh, MVPDs negotiating between broadcasters. Would you consider the current relationship a true free market, or is there some government intervention there? Well, as you know, we've exercised uh, humility, regulatory humility in the in the area of uh, retransmission consent negotiations. Certainly. Uh, 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 some have argued that uh, there isn't a true free market there, that there are advantages that one side has over the other. Uh, we've opened a proceeding to monitor it. Uh, we haven't yet seen a strong enough case for government intervention. But there is, there, I mean, there are rules right now, you know, preferred channel placement, uh, basic tier must carry. Uh, those are government mandates that interfere with a pure free market. Uh, I don't know if you would agree with that or not, but... I think there's, there's certainly the argument is that, is that uh, uh, provisions like that uh, distort uh, the market when it comes to retransmission consent negotiations. Uh, that is the subject of an open proceeding that we have. All right. and, and I know, final question, I know this is something that, that Congress would have to decide, but if Congress were to, to repeal a compulsory copyright license and retransmission and, and go to a kind of a broader free market, uh, in that relationship between the, you know, the, the satellite and the cable carriers and, and the broadcasters, wouldn't there still need to be a negotiation over a copyright license? If we were to repeal those laws, uh, would, would the, 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 ca the carriers just be able to get it for free, or would they have to have still some negotiated agreement to carry that signal from a broadcaster? I would presume there would have to be an arm's-length negotiation uh, in any situation. Yeah, because there would still be traditional copyright laws that would be in effect. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be the yeah. case? All right. Appreciate it. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back, and I'm sure he doesn't know anybody that has a bill that would do any of those things, but we uh, We, well, we could sure get, get, yeah. one, uh, get one out there and have a hearing on it if you would be so gracious, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We, we now go to uh, uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Shimkus, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Chairman, for coming here. I was talking to some colleagues before I was moseying over, and I just told them, you know, you were going to be appearing before us, and I said, you know, a lot can be learned about friendliness, returning phone calls, gracious smile. I mean, I, um, even though in public policy there's always fights, uh, you, you handle yourself with great decorum, and I just I appreciate that, and I think that helps us in the bipartisan nature of trying to deal with some of this stuff. So Thank you. Um, the, um, this is um, um, Congresswoman Blackburn, um, and actually Congressman Scalise kind of hit on this, and you answered a little bit about the... Uh, the employees in the landline, as I would use the vocabulary, and how we know everything's moving to cellular technology, and of course you know my interest in broadband applications to rural America. Um, you did mention how uh, there always is a backbone, so there's still a need. But is there, I guess in looking through the budget, seeing the, the number of full-time employees that are dealing in the wireline, and uh, is there plans to be able to shift full-time equivalent positions while keeping what you need for the backbone, but also there, there is still an, more of an explosion in, in the area of um, broadband and, and wireless technology? And I guess that's the question is how many, not exactly, but the shifting of that, is that a possibility in, in what you've got planned? Well, these are exactly the kinds of issues we talk about in the budgeting process, uh, and uh, and we run it as a company would run it, and you know different uh, bureaus make their case for what they need, and 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 we regard our job uh, as doing capital allocation as against uh, overall targets. Uh, so it's a. Uh, I would say that you know, no, no one, uh, none of our specific areas are completely satisfied with their budget, um, uh, but we also think at the end of the day they have what they need to get their work done. Yeah, and again, the uh, obviously the turf fights that are involved in government and also in the private sector, trying to, uh, we would hope to see that move in a new technology area. Yep, maintaining enough to, to maintain, like uh, like we talked about, the needed backbone, but we want to make sure that we have the people on the ground, and of course we're not in a growing government mode, as everyone agrees. So that's uh, the shifting would be a better aspect of being able to do that. Uh, following up on last July, uh, the commission promised to open a further rulemaking on rebalancing the regulatory fees before the end of 2011. Do you, can you give us a status report on where that's at? 
the, I asked about this in the status report uh, that, that I got is uh, it's being actively working on. Uh, we recognize it's something uh, that we should move forward on, and, uh, and I've asked the team to accelerate that. And the, the final question I have is really the, the, the fees used to manage the spectrum auctions. Um, obviously, based upon what may happen pretty soon, that's going to be really important. We've seen some years where there is a, a big need. Some years may not be as big, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, but there seems to be a consistent $85 million per year every year. Um, and the concern is, is that a real evaluation of the cost needed to do the spectrum auction, uh, ramping up or ramping down? Uh, some years that may not be enough. We may be coming to one. Um, some years it may be way too much. So. Can you give me some analysis on, on that pot of money and the whole spectrum debate? So Yes, of course, a, a, a few thoughts. One is um, the, the auction work is very active all the time, even when it's not in the newspapers. For example, we held uh, several auctions uh, last year. They were uh, not uh, super high value auctions, but they require the machinery, they require the expertise, and they require them to be professionally handled. Uh, and then the auction teams are always getting ready for the next auction and licensing and implementing the last auction. Um, uh, we do find that almost every year the requests from the auction team for funding uh, are higher than the $85 million cap. And uh, I have mixed feelings about it because on one hand, auctions have proven to be such a high return on investment for the country. If we could put more resources into it, could we move faster on auctioning spectrum? Uh, possible, although uh, given uh, fiscal constraints, we're working within uh, the cap uh, that's there. And, uh, and yes, uh, we'll have a challenge uh, next year, assuming incentive auction legislation passes to, uh, uh, to do what we need to do, but, but we'll, we'll burn the, uh, all the candles, the midnight oil, whatever it is that one has to burn to get it done. So you're basically saying the 85 is, is really a ceiling that, that really is accounted for every year, regardless of what the perception may be is? the real value of, a, of an auction. You're saying that, that that is a pretty good baseline for what you need every year. Yes, and we have internal processes to make sure uh, that it's appropriate, yes. And, and we, didn't, we didn't go back and look at uh, what the value would be if we increase that uh, by 10 or 20. Uh, uh, you know, in this fiscal uh, climate, we think our obligation is to work with what we have uh, to be efficient uh, uh, everywhere. And uh, if, as we're working through, if uh, assuming the legislation is passed and we're working through it, if issues come up, you can be sure I'll be back and we'll work on it together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for being with us today. Appreciate it, and also to hear your testimony. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion, of course, on the USF, and I, I might change gears just a little bit here and might get back to it, but uh, I found in your testimony, it's kind of interesting, you were talking about um, the small business cyber planner and uh, to ward off cyber attacks. I served on the Republican uh, Cybersecurity Task Force not too long ago. It's an ongoing problem is a, uh, and uh, I guess a couple of the questions are how are you getting that information out to businesses that uh, they know that they should be contact who they could contact who is there someone specifically in uh, at the Commission that uh, is in charge of it are you working with other departments and agencies so you're not once again like we sometimes we do in government reinvent the wheel each time someone touches it somebody else does it instead of having it all put together it's a great point, and I feel very strongly about this. Uh, uh, in uh, the cyber um, uh, planner, we did that together with the Small Business Administration, the Chamber of Commerce, the National Urban League, some other companies. We wanted to start with a base of people who said, listen, here's one piece of paper. You don't have to look at a lot of different pieces of paper. Since then, we've been working to extend the distribution. We just met two days ago, and I asked my team for a game plan to take distribution to the next level. What agencies, can we work with members of Congress and ask you to distribute it uh, in your communities? What else can we do? We did something similar with uh, FEMA and emergency communications tips, where I approached uh, 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 Craig Fugate at FEMA and said, let's work on this together. We put out a joint tip sheet to help consumers prepare for disasters. Uh, and we are now putting in a place, a, 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 a plan in place to get uh, other agencies, federal, state, and local, to uh, look at those, work on having a common uh, set of advice for consumers, and then use all our collective distribution 
capacities to get it out. And we, I very much enjoy working with you on this. Well, that, that's important because uh, I know the more that I've talked with a lot of my constituents, there's just not a little, you know, they're not really aware of it. They, uh, you know, it happens to somebody else, it never happens to me. Or they don't even know what happened to them. You know, they, uh, they're hit by someone from another country. And we just had uh, hearings in this committee uh, last week, a week ago Wednesday it was, and how fast uh, these uh, cyber attacks occur. And I think it's really important that we make sure that in you know, these small businesses, but also I think that you know, we always talk in some cases about the small businesses. It's, I think some of the larger businesses out there don't realize what risk they are at. So I think it's, it's, it's incumbent on us to also make sure we get that information out to everybody out there to make sure that they understand that, uh, that there's a, um, a real problem. But I, I'm sorry, did you say that you do have somebody at the, uh, the commission that is designated as the point person so that you will be all coordinating and working together like with Homeland Security or wh whoever else? Okay, thank you. And go, going back to the general lady from uh, Tennessee when, in her line of questionings and talking, when you had mentioned your testimony about that you had eliminated more than 200 outdated rules and five unnecessary data collection. Now, this is going just the reverse way of what we were just talking about. I, I, we hear from a lot of different uh, businesses, and again, small and large, that uh, there's a lot of, that one of the time, things that really cost them a lot of money and a lot of time is they have six agencies or departments that they've got to comply with. Is that something that you're all looking at uh, within the commission to make sure that all of a sudden that, you know, there's other agencies, departments out there that are trying to do the exact same thing. They're incurring more costs on these individuals out there or small businesses to prevent them from going out and making a profit. Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Mr. Chairman, thank you for being here today. We look forward to continuing our good work together. And uh, if uh, all comes to fruition on the uh, Spectrum bill as part of the overall agreement, and I think it, I have no reason to doubt it won't, uh, we'll be spending a lot of time because I don't think anybody's ever done an incentive auction before. And uh, we want to make sure we're in partnership with you to get it right. So thank you very much. We'll call up our uh, second and final panel of witnesses, the Inspector General for the uh, Federal Communications Commis Commission, Mr. David H. Hunt, and the Chief Executive Officer of the Universal Service Administrative Company, Scott Bar Barash. And I'll just uh, give you the microphone guidance here. The closer you can get to them, the better they work, and the light needs to be on, and, and uh, then we'll, we'll be able to hear you. So you really have to get close to these microphones. Mr. Hunt, thank you for being here. Well, thank you both for being here. Mr. Hunt, thank you, and we'll start with your testimony today, sir. I'm, I'm not sure that microphone's on. Push the button there. Oh. Is that okay? That's okay. much better. Thank oh, you. The light was on before. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to come before you today to discuss the activities and budget of the Office of Inspector General for the Federal Communications Commission. I've been the Inspector General at the FCC since June of 2009, first in an acting capacity and in a permanent role since January 
2011. Um, somebody mentioned to me when I, when I first walked in, I understand you're a veteran of these, and, and I am not. This is my first time at a hearing, um, and I, only, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I have a very, very well-written speech about my staff. Um, but as a former trial attorney, I'm better just going off my notes, and, and that's what I'm going to do. And the, and the silent groan you hear behind me is my staff who wrote, who wrote my speech. Um, what I'd like to talk about primarily, because I think I may have given you more information than you may have wanted in my written statement just about my staff and their dedication. It ties to the fact that we have a very small staff looking uh, over a very large amount of money. In the past two years alone, I have had an auditor who uh, we had a filing that was due at midnight, a mandatory filing. She had she suddenly got sick, was sent to the hospital. Um, she, on her own accord, ripped the IVs out of her arm and came back to work to make sure everything was filed on time. I have an auditor who has worked on E-rate for over a decade. He has spent on average six to nine months of his life on the road uh, tracking down uh, fraud, waste, and abuse in schools and libraries. Um, I have an attorney who dictated an affidavit from a hospital bed with the nurse taking notes, running faxes to, to and from uh, a judge in Texas because he required the affidavit before he made a filing uh, on a motion in court. Um, I had to send half of my staff to Texas to support the Department of Justice in another USF investigation because of the, the number of staff we had left. I had to send interns with them. Uh, these uh, attorneys and auditors, inc including uh, uh, just regular staff people, um, had to crawl under uh, uh, wireless equipment, had to crawl under uh, uh, buildings, had to uh, uh, pull wires and, and, and uh, just check everything. Um, you'd be surprised how many times you, you go to a school and see all the lights on, then you go behind it and there's nothing plugged in except the power and somebody wrote a program to make the lights go on and off. Um, I've had an attorney who had to do a conference call, had to do a conference call, while in the emergency room, while the nurse was placing nitroglycerin under his tongue. Um, our staff works very, very hard with what assets we have. Um, you're asking for actually very few people to oversee billions and billions of dollars. Um, any other uh, IG office out there would have several people, if not, if not dozens of people, working on the stuff that we rely on one or two people to do. Um, anyway, um, I just want you to know that we really appreciate uh, the chance for coming here. We work very closely with the Department of Justice, Department of Education, Department of Interior. We're trying to save money all the time. We're trying to run as efficiently as humanly possible. Uh, Factually-wise, we, we can't do anything less because, we're, like I said, we're operating on such a, on such a tight budget. But I want to let you know that uh, the staff you have at the FCC, Office of Inspector General, are as dedicated as a staff as you will ever see in the federal government. And we appreciate this chance to talk, and I look forward to coming back and talking again if I have the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. That's a very moving testimony. We appreciate and applaud the work that you and your people do at the uh, at the agency. Thank you. We we might want to have some guidance here, though, about pulling out IVs and things. But it, it it wasn't easy. Apparently, some one of our staff drove over to the hospital, Mr. Chairman, and wow. and just waited there with her. But um, and in fact, the hospital called, wondering where she was. <laughs> so I think she's back. In, I think she's back in her office. Um, <laughs> But thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. John. Sir, uh, is it Barash or Barash? Barash. Barash, I'm sorry. Thank Mr. You. Barash, right thank you for being here. We look forward to learning more about USAC and uh, thank you. appreciate Good morning. your testimony. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Ranking Member Shue. My name is Scott Barash, and I'm the Acting Chief Executive Officer of the Universal Service Administrative Company, or USAC. USAC is the independent not-for-profit corporation created in 1997 to administer the Universal Service Support Mechanisms. USAC is governed by a board of directors selected by the chairman of the FCC from nominations by universal service stakeholder groups. 
USAC's mission is to collect FCC mandated contributions from telecommunications carriers and distribute these funds to beneficiaries in the four universal service support programs, high cost, low income, rural health care, and schools and libraries in accordance with FCC rules, orders, and directives. As the neutral administrator, USAC does not establish policy and may not advocate for policy positions. In order to accomplish our mission, we work very closely with the FCC, which oversees our operations. In 2011, USAC collected $8.4 billion in contributions from telecommunications carriers and dispersed approximately $8.1 billion to beneficiaries. USAC spent $106.9 million to collect and distribute these funds, generating an administrative expense rate of 1.34 percent. In other words, 98.66 percent of contributions from telecommunications carriers went to universal service program beneficiaries. This percentage compares favorably to the rate at which other federal assistance programs and nonprofit organizations deliver funds to their beneficiaries. I will now briefly describe the four universal service programs, what USAC does to administer those programs, and how much we spent in 2011 to do so. The high cost program provides support to ensure that telecommunications rates and services available to customers who live in rural or hard to serve areas are reasonably comparable to rates and services available in urban areas. In calendar year 2011, the high cost program dispersed $4 billion to 1,903 companies in support of 110 million lines. To provide program support, every month USAC gathers data from companies, performs extensive calculations to derive the support they are eligible for, and makes disbursements to them. To administer the high cost program in 2011, USAC spent $16.9 million. The low income program provides support to make voice telephony affordable to eligible low income consumers. USAC's rule, role is to disperse to telecommunications carriers a defined dollar amount each month for each eligible consumer <coughs> to whom they provide discounted services. Administering the low income program is similar to the high cost program. We gather data from companies every month, perform calculations on that data, and then make monthly disbursements. In 2011, the low income program dispersed $1.7 billion to 2,025 companies. To administer the low income program in 2011, we spent $5.4 million. The rural health care program provides reduced rates to eligible health care providers for telecommunications and internet services necessary for the provision of health care. Eligible participants must be rural, public, or nonprofit health care providers. USAC is responsible for processing applications for support, confirming eligibility pursuant to FCC rules, and reimbursing service providers for discounts delivered to rural health care providers. We review applications, invoices, and other program information to ensure that applicants and service providers follow FCC rules and support FCC efforts to prevent and detect waste, fraud, and abuse. In 2011, the Rural Health Care Program dispersed $81.5 million to 472 companies representing 3,088 eligible health care providers and another $54.3 million to beneficiaries of the Rural Health Care Program. To administer the program, we spent $12.7 million. The Schools and Libraries Program, commonly known as E-Rate, provides discounts of up to 90 percent to assist most schools and libraries in the United States in obtaining affordable telecommunications and internet access services. Program funds are dispersed to companies providing services to elig eligible beneficiaries, in this case public and most nonprofit K-12 schools and all public and many pro pro private libraries. Administration of the Schools and Libraries Program is much like it is in rural health care. We process applications for support, confirm eligibility, and reimburse telecommunications companies and internet access providers for discounts delivered to beneficiaries. In 2011, the program reviewed 44,651 applications and dispersed $2.2 billion to 4,165 companies providing services to tens of thousands of schools and libraries in all states and territories of the United States. To administer the program, we spent $71.9 million. Universal service contributions, which we spoke of in the prior panel, come from telecommunications carriers earning revenues from providing interstate and international calling services. These companies file revenue data with USAC, which we aggregate and submit to the FCC. In 2011, to bill and collect the $8.4 billion in universal service contributions, we spent approximately $3 million. An important responsibility of USAC is to port, support FCC efforts to protect the integrity of the fund. We do this in many ways, from reviewing information submitted by contributors and beneficiaries to assessing details about individual payments to full-scale audits of contributors and beneficiaries. These measures are designed to verify the accuracy of data used in calculating collections and disbursements, the eligibility of supported goods and services, and participants' compliance with program requirements. 
A memorandum, memorandum of understanding between the FCC and USAC defines the roles and responsibilities and contains detailed operational and reporting requirements. Once we disperse money to beneficiaries, we want to validate that the payments were properly made. To this end, working with the FCC and OMB, we launched in 2010 a Payment Quality Assurance, or PQA, program. PQA is designed to provide estimates of improper payments in all four programs as required by the Improper Payments Elimination and Recovery Act, or IPERA. Based on the assessments, an independent statistician calculates estimates of improper payment rates for each program and reports this information to the FCC. We also use these results as a basis to improve internal procedures associated with improper payments and provide outreach to beneficiaries. Results for 2011, based on 1,600 assessments, show improper payment rates in the high-cost program of 0.11 percent, the low-income program of 0.23 percent, the rural health care program of 1.7 percent, and the schools and libraries program of 0.94 percent. We spent $1.3 million on this activity in 2011. We've also done audits of beneficiaries and contributors. Shortly after the PQA launch in 2010, again in close consultation with the FCC and OMB, we launched the Beneficiary and Contributor Audit Program, or BCAP. Under BCAP in 2011, we completed 79 audits examining $1.7 billion in universal service funding. When fully implemented, BCAP will give USAC the capacity to, con to conduct up to 343 audits each year. As with PQA, results will shape corrective actions for both auditees and USAC. Outside auditors have consistently delivered clean opinions on USAC's finances and procedures. In the last four years, USAC has significantly revised and upgraded its internal controls review program in compliance with the principles of OMB Circular A123. Program staff members have incorporated these controls into operational activities to enhance the security and accuracy of procedures that define how we handle the information we gather and the funds we collect and distribute. The GAO has recommended that USAC and the FCC conduct robust risk assessments in the schools and libraries program and the low-income program. We are working with the FCC to identify independent contractors to carry out these risk assessments, and we expect to use these results as a basis for efforts to strengthen further the internal controls already in place. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for uh, your testimony. Um, I appreciate uh, your testimony and the work that you're doing to try and continue to improve and reduce fraud and, and deal with all that. I, uh, I was made aware a year or two ago of a, a situation in my district, and I won't get into the, the specifics of it, but they had overlapping people uh, that were on sort of both sides of some of the, the USAC funding. I think it was in the E-rate program. And the problem, uh, I think, you know, they may not have followed all the rules, I don't know. Uh, that's something for all you to figure out. But you've got these really isolated remote communities. I'm talking one person for every eight miles of power line. Uh, counties with fewer than 2,000 people and thousands of miles. And there's very, very few people, like the main town, the county the hub is 399 people, I think. And so when they go to try and take advantage of these programs, there isn't a giant pool of people who can be, you know, you're on the school board, you're also the guy running the phone. You're, now, having said that, I've also served in the Oversight Committee when we did a lot of look at the waste, fraud, and abuse and, and all of that. I, and, and we can't tolerate that. But I, I hope there's some way to find a balance here for these um, really remote communities where they're only, they're very, there's only a handful of people that do everything, and not because of collusion or anything else. They just ain't, ain't anybody else around, you know? And, and so I, I, I hope maybe in the, it, we can have some general discussion about that uh, somewhere down the road, because I think it is a problem that's unique to sort of the rural West, perhaps, where literally, uh, you know, you don't even have a hospital in three of these counties. I mean, it's, that, it's just remote, no stoplight for probably three hours, you know, I mean, it, this is uh, high desert remote. So uh, and yet they're trying to figure out how to serve their communities. And so um, I just throw that out for your consideration. Well, we, we, we are very sensitive to the, the needs of our customers and what is we- Is your mic on? Yes. There you go. I'll get closer. Yeah, it's um, close. We are very sensitive to the needs of, of our customers, particularly the small rural customers, both in for schools and libraries and, right. and rural health care, as well as right. uh, high cost. And what we have tried to do in recent years is to really expand our outreach 
and uh, that includes uh, training sessions around the country. Right. That includes our uh, webinar presence. Yeah. That includes going out to stakeholder groups, um, whether it's schools, whether it's healthcare providers, right. or telecom groups. So we've really tried to focus on that because you're correct that, that one of the problems is that you might have the same person who's doing everything. And, and they are, and they do that in everything in these small towns. And, and then addition, in addition, there's often turnover. So right. the person who, who knows everything and who had the files leaves, and then someone else inherits this, and they may not understand or, what the... Uh, or they may also be on the school board and at the phone company, and by the way, the county judge. Who drives the snowplow truck? I mean, it, it, it literally happens that way in I, some I think, of these I, areas. You're absolutely right. And they're just trying to figure out how to get broadband or whatever out to their schools and their communities and connect them. And then lo and behold, they realize they've stumbled across some line that said, oh, you can't be on both of these. And then they get penalized. The community gets penalized because it's like, well, you don't get any more money. And by the way, we're going to take back what you have and da-da-da-da-da. And they're just going, ah, oh, man, all I was trying to do here... And yet I've seen the other side of this coin where people manipulated the system and had warehouses full of computers they never intended to deploy and ripped off the fund. And so I... It's, it's a balance that we, that we try to strike every day in yeah. administering the program. And we, we try to do as much upfront review as possible and uh, to, to prevent having to go back because that's, uh, that's the worst of, yeah. of all worlds. So we, we are very focused on, uh, on, the, on the outreach piece and also on the upfront review piece. Yeah. So anyway, this group is in the middle of that morass and trying to dig its way out, and it's not good. Um, Mr. Hunt, in your written testimony, you highlighted a single company that was able to defraud the FCC's telecommunications relay service of $55 million, and you also suggest that the work of the IG ultimately led to 26 indictments in that case. What happened there? Um, hi, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, it was a program that um, you know, we've been aware of for a while. Um, uh, it, it, it's something where you, you don't know how bad it is till you get into it. And, and we were surprised, too. I mean, the entire FCC Inspector General Office hasn't had 26 indictments in non-USF cases ever in, in the over decade it's operated. Um, the more we dug, the, the worse they got. And, and again, not to be cry my or bemoan my um, staffing situation, I had, I had two people sitting behind you who, who you know, pretty much did it with support from the rest of our staff. But um, when we did the, um, that one raid, we had 40 FBI agents going with us. We had to go in nine different states. You're looking at a program that... Um, just wasn't looked at that much, and um, 26 indictments was was amazing for us. We had no idea, but um, it, it's so easy on that program to to defraud the government. I could go in my home, get a computer, light it up, and I could defraud the government for money. Frankly, well, I, I appreciate you, that. Maybe you can help us uh, identify more areas we need to spend more time digging into as well and be helpful in that respect. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we've, we've been working with Congress as much as yeah. we can. We've been working with the Chairman's office. We've yeah. made many recommendations as at DOJ right. and how to stop this fraud and, and stop it from occurring. We're, we're working both ends. Stop it on the front end with the, with, right. with the Chairman's right. help and get it from the back. Thank you. And, and then maybe your people won't have to pull out their IVs to go stop it. we got to stop first. So, <laughs> and, and those recommendations, I'm sure you've made those available to us uh, in past reports and all. But if there are some specifics you think we should dig down into more and kind of look at the policy and help shine the light on, uh, we'd be happy to do that. Absolutely, well. Mr. Chairman. Absolutely. Thank you. I turn to my, uh, my friend from California, Ms. Eshing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to concur with you that uh, uh, on this uh, last item that uh, how uh, we can – help uh, uh, support and advance uh, the work that you're doing. Um, we're um, eager to do that. Uh, I want to thank you, um, not only for doing what you do, but with the um, really a high level of, uh, of integrity and commitment and dedication. We're going through a, um, an era, I think, where um, because of all the challenges in the country, so many people are angry, they feel let down. Um, I mean, you can go on and on. I was at a telephone town hall meeting last night where 9,000 people participated. Obviously, I didn't get to answer 9,000 questions. 
But uh, if there were a common thread that went through it, it was uh, how people, how concerned they are about our country. And um, uh, I wish every TV station in the country could have carried um, your opening statement today. Um, because it's a reflection of, um, of, uh, of really professional, uh, good, solid people um, working uh, to make the country better and the government more accountable. So I, I really salute you. And I, I, um, I don't know if, uh, I, I don't think my words are adequate uh, to describe um, uh, all that, I, um, uh, that I'm sensing, but uh, bravo to you and to your team, and thank you. Thank you very much. You Constantine. really restore a great deal of, um, of uh, faith in, uh, in all of this. And as I said uh, in my opening statement, I think the IGs are um, uh, uh, just, uh, if you want to know what's going on in the government and you want a clear, uh, unbiased, uh, nonpartisan, uh, hard look at what's going on in, uh, in every agency, just uh, go to the IG inspectors and, uh, uh, and the work and the reports that they issue. So uh, thank you again. Uh, your most recent semi-annual report indicated that the proposed reforms of the uh, Universal Service Fund, quote, will have a significant impact on OIG planning and conduct <coughs> and oversight activities. Um, can you explain exactly what that, um, what that means? What will be the change under the reforms? Is that what you're referring to? What um, you're going to have to do to track the, um, uh, the new program? Uh, I, yes, Congresswoman, um, whenever any change is made, we, we sometimes have to tack to the left or tack to the right. Um, we study everything. You know, I have a separate person who studies everything. He's dedicated to working on, on Hill matters. He studies everything that comes out. We study everything from USAC. We work with USAC uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, but. You know, every time a, a, a rule or regulation changes, it may change one of our cases, either civilly or criminally. And so it's something we have to track pretty much constantly. Uh, a, a large part of what do we do is... Do you have the resources to do this, what you're describing? Well, um, let me just say... Well's not a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't mean that in a personal way. I, it's, you sound... Um, Skeptical. Uh, no, Congresswoman, I'm not skeptical. We don't. Okay. We don't. But, but I just want to let um, the Congresswoman know we have been working very closely with the Chairman's Office to, to try to get additional staffing. Um, the, the Congress was, was kind enough to give us additional monies uh, for 2012, fiscal year 2012. Um, we spend those monies, uh, if not on personnel, on, on contracts. Um, uh, to do further auditing work, but I, I've thought about it several times. Where Where is the cap? I mean, how many people would you have to add to the IG shop before it's not worth adding people and, and the number could reach into? I mean, you could give me 50 people tomorrow, I could put them all to work. So I don't know how else to explain it. Well, my sense is, is that you don't think you have enough to do um, what needs to be done, but... Um, uh, do you think you're going to be able to fulfill your oversight responsibilities? Well, um, Congresswoman, uh, the, the staff we have is, is, is very good. And it, it, any program this big could always use additional oversight, could always use it. I know um, USAC has added additional people um, to their staff to help mm -hmm. do audits. But... Um, like I said, you're, you're trying to track about $10 billion with about 30 people. Um, and when the economy goes south, uh, the crime rate, at least in our field, goes up. So white collar crime is booming. And on, on one case alone, we have a single person tracing down $110 million mm -hmm. um, with no FBI support and, and no, no other support from, from DOJ. So they've had to cut back as well. So as they cut back, all of a sudden we find ourselves having to do depositions and interviews where normally the FBI would do those for us. And mm -hmm. now there's not enough FBI agents around mm -hmm. to help us uh, accomplish that. So. Well, we want to be of uh, 
of all assistance to you because your work is so important. And, and uh, Mr. Barash, I'm sorry I don't have time to ask you uh, the great questions I was going to ask you, but I'll submit them to you in writing. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. And thank you both for your um, very important uh, work and to, um, uh, to your entire team. Thank you, Councilman. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Ladd, is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hunt, Mr. Brash, thanks very much for being with us today. Appreciate uh, your testimony. Uh, if I could just start off with this question, maybe to both of you, that uh, state commissions have also been uh, out there detecting duplication and other waste uh, within the commission's lifeline program. And what efforts have your respective offices made to reach out to the state commissions to also address these and related concerns? Um, thank you, Congressman, for that question. Actually. Congressman, um, another one of my AIGs behind me is coordinating an effort within our office um, and has contacted uh, literally all 50 states. We're actively coordinating with, I believe, at last count, eight or nine. So we work very closely with the states on low income and, and lifeline issues. Um, primarily what we do is, is basically ask for their support because they can offer us the most help at the local level than we can offer uh, from Washington, D.C. But we are very much interacting with, with local governments and, and do so, frankly, all the time. Okay. Let me ask this. Uh, going back to the, the chairman's testimony, I'm sure you heard a little bit earlier, and you all, you all know that um, in the Lifeline program, the whole idea is in the, in the next three years to be able to save up to $2 billion that's going to be out there. And also, uh, in 2011 alone, saving uh, $33 million, eliminating 270,000 duplicate subscriptions. Could you kind of go through the procedures, how you find these folks, and uh, what happens when you do, and do you recoup payment, or what happens? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. What, what we do is we collect data from the companies, correct, collect subscriber data to, from the companies. We then bump that data up against each other in a system that we built last year uh, to, to do this job. We then identify potential duplicates. We reach back out to the companies and say, are these in fact duplicates? They get back to us. We then um, have a final list of duplicates. We then allocate the duplicates to one of the other companies randomly and then instruct the other company to de-enroll the subscriber. So it, it's a relatively... Um, cumbersome process at this point. Yeah, pardon me for interrupting. How long does that, just, you know, from point A to point B, does, how long does that take? Uh, a couple months by the time it's mm -hmm. the, the, the back and forth okay. occurs. Um, so it's a relatively cumbersome process at the moment. Um, it's a one that we initiated in very close consultation with the FCC last year. Uh, what we are moving toward, and this is in the uh, recent order that was approved by the Commission, is a National Lifeline Accountability Database that we are now working on that we hope to have up in early 2013 that will allow companies on a real-time basis to determine whether someone is already receiving Lifeline service or not. So right now we're in an, in an interim phase where we are identifying duplicates and saving money, but then in the future, we will be doing this up front and preventing this problem from occurring uh, in the first place. Okay. And then uh, going back to my one question, uh, after you do identify that individual, let's just say that they might have had three or four that might have happened. Is there a recoupment or what happens at that stage? At this stage, there's not recoupment. They're, they're, they're cut off. They're, if they have more than one, uh, they're cut off from all of them. So if there is a, we have seen an instance, instance or two where there are, uh, someone might be getting three um, and they would be cut off from two of those. Okay. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Guthrie has no questions. We appreciate the incredible work you all do. And we look forward to working with you to improve uh, transparency, efficiency, and uh, accountability in the work that's done by the agency. So thank you for being here. And with that, uh, we'll have the usual and customary opportunity for members to submit statements and questions. We look forward to your responses. And thanks again. Thank this, you very much. Uh, hearing thank, is you. Adjourned. thank you very much.